In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I made a pressed up crankshaft for my six cylinder RC374. When I started making my RC374, the important things to me were it had to be the right size and it had to sound right and rev right. So it was really important that I got the crankshaft really lightweight and short stroke. I did some research and found out that the Honda RC174 had a 41mm bore and a 37.5mm stroke. And the individual crankshaft parts were really small. By comparison, the Yamaha FZR250RR engine has a much shorter stroke of only 34.5mm. That's 3mm shorter than the Honda, but the bore is 48 So although it might have a slightly deeper sound, it should scream. To get the sound I was looking for, I'd need to get rid of the standard Yamaha one-piece crankshaft and make my own pressed-up crankshaft with similar dimensions as the original Honda 174 300cc crank. So the first thing I did was get some strips of marred steel bar and make up a one-cylinder crankshaft, replicating the sizes I'd need for my six-cylinder crankshaft. I could also work out the balance factor at the same time. I made the dummy crankshaft so I could slide it apart easily by hand without using my press. And here's a portion of the Yamaha crankshaft. You can see how big it is by comparison. It's almost twice as heavy. I've got a big tin of old conrods in my shed, so I went up to the shed to have a bit of a rummage to see if I could find something suitable. I needed a roller bearing conrod off a T-stroke, maybe a 50cc or thereabouts. That would be just perfect. It's really useful having a box of conrods. I use them for size gauging. So if you're making an engine and you need a special rod, you have a little rummage, you might find something that's the right size and then you can go buy new ones. And this one looks just perfect. I'll just check to see if there's any more, but this one looks like the best one. No, that's definitely too big. But this one's off a Kawasaki KX60, probably for my son Stephen's race bike. He was a fast rider. I was always changing comrades. Well, the KX60 rod looks like it's going to do the job perfectly. It's almost the same size as the SZR 250R rod. And when I weigh the Yamaha rod, it's 144 grams. And when I weigh the Kawasaki rod, it's 104 grams. So it's 40 grams lighter. And that'll make a massive difference. The next thing I did was make up a dummy brass bush for the little end eye of the new Comrod so that it would fit the FZR250RR piston. Then I had to make up some plastic sleeves for the crankshaft so that it would sit in the unmodified crankcases because I've yet to line bore them to fit the needle roller bearings. With all this done, I could try my dummy crankshaft in the crankcases. I bought these INA needle roller bearings for the mains. They're slightly larger than the existing mains, which means I can bore them out after the welding to fit. I dropped the dummy crankshaft in and it fitted perfect. I was really excited. The top case went on and it rotated freely and the balance felt just right. With the crankshaft fitting nicely, the next thing I want to do is put on the piston and the barrel and see if the deck height's okay. So I went to push in the gudgeon pin and it was really tight. So I thought I'll pop out into my barbecue to warm the piston. Two minutes later, it was really hot, so I thought I'd better let it cool down a little bit before I fit it to the engine. So I went back through the house and Tracy's cooked more cupcakes, but this time I took two. I was so hungry, I ate both the cupcakes. Now back to this piston, it just slid on perfect now. The gudgeon pin pushed straight into the new little end bush and it felt great. So on with the barrel, I slide down this little portion of barrel turn the engine over with the crankshaft and the piston comes straight out the top. I thought, oh dear, that's a bit high. What are we going to do here? But it's ever so easy to rectify. I measure the distance that it sticks out and we make a spacer to go under the barrel to lift it up. I used my vernier caliper to measure the distance the piston was sticking up and it turned out to be exactly four millimetres, which isn't too bad really. So all I have to do now is make my spacer. So I made the spacer 3.5 millimetres thick to allow for a couple of bits of gasket and even Charlie Weaver was really excited. With the crankshaft tested on one cylinder, all I had to do now was make six of them and join them all together. So I made a piece of wire up first by bending it with my Swiss Army knife pliers 
to get the actual size and throw I wanted so I can visualise it. It's always better to have something to look at because sometimes you get confused in your mind's eye, especially when you're trying to work out where all the cam sharp lobes go, and this was invaluable. I got a sheet of wallpaper and put on my dining room table and drew the crankshaft out full size to see if it would fit in the engine, and it just fitted, which was really pleasing. So I got all the pieces of metal ordered, and they just arrived so I could start machining the crankshaft webs. I made the crankshaft webs from EN40T and the billets were long enough so I could machine the actual crank pins integral with six of the webs and the journals integral with the other six of the webs so they all slotted together to make a one piece pressed up crankshaft. And here's one of the centre journals being roughed out. I roughed out all 12 flyable webs, leaving the six big end journals and the six crank journals slightly oversized for fine machining later on. With all the diameter machining finished on each web, I gripped it in my four jaw chuck one at a time and machined them into their rectangular shape. The webs are starting to take shape now, but I still haven't tackled the gear. That's the one on the top right, and that'll be driving the gearbox. I then set up the crankshaft webs on my Miller machine rotary table and mill the end radiuses. The next thing I have to do is make a fixture to accurately machine the flyable webs. I use a toolmaker's button to align the centre of the big end journal bore exactly 17.25mm from the centre line of the crankshaft. With the fixture set up in my four jaw chuck on my lathe, I can now insert each flywheel web in turn on its big end journal and machine the bore of the centre journal at the exact location. Using this fixture ensures that the centre line of the big end and the centre line of the main journal is identical on each of the flywheel webs, ensuring that when they're pressed together the crankshaft will run true. I cut off the gear from the Yamaha crankshaft, bored out the centre on my lathe and then made it a really tight interference fit onto the flywheel web for the new crankshaft. This was then pressed on in my press and pinned. I laid out the parts on the bench and it was starting to look really good but the next thing I had to do was find balance the flywheel webs. I used a method described in my old 1955 book called Tuning for Speed that describes how to balance crankshafts. I do them one cylinder at a time and when you put them together, especially in a straight six, they're perfectly balanced. So what you have to do at first is weigh the reciprocating mass and then the rotating mass. So the little end is part of the reciprocating mass and the big end is part of the rotating mass. And the piston's part of the reciprocating mass. You work out all these figures, put them into the formula and it tells you the weight to hang onto the connecting rod so that you can spin the crankshaft round and it should stop in a separate place every time. And here you can see my test crankshaft resting on its needle roller bearings and it always stops with a conrod high. So I add this little pile of weights that I've calculated onto the little end eye and now when I rotate it, wherever I leave it, it stays stationary, showing it's got perfect static balance. On the flywheel web next to the one that has the gear to the primary drive, I had to actually add some weight, it was too light. So to do this, I drilled two 10 millimetre holes and inserted two slugs of tungsten because tungsten's about two and a half times the weight of steel. To demonstrate the weight difference, the slug on the left is mild steel and the slug on the right is tungsten. So when I weigh the tungsten, it's 20 grams. And when I weigh the mild steel one, it's eight grams. And here you can see the two tungsten slugs pressed into the flywheel web. So with all the machining done and the balls roughed out, I go out to my shed to buff up all the flywheel webs to a mirror shine. It's quite cold in my shed, but the buffer soon heats the parts up and that warms my hands up, so that's a good thing. Hello? Hello? Is that the operator? It is. Great. Do you think you could check my line? I've not been getting any international calls recently and I'm worried in case there's a problem. Well, everything seems to be okay. Well, that's great then. Okay then. Bye.
After an hour or so in the shed, all the parts are really shiny and ready for the next stage. In this shot, you can see the holes I drilled to cross flow the ore from the mains to the big ends. The last thing I had to do was to put the crankshaft webs back in the fixture on the lathe and skim out the bores to the right size for the interference fit. And one last check on my DTI before I take the cut and it was running perfect. This was a critical stage of the machining process. I had to hit the exact size first time. If I was slightly over, the whole flyable web would be scrap and I'd have to start again. I used an old Honda 50 crankshaft flyable web to test the interference fit of the central shaft for the new crankshaft before I pressed on the gear. This is the central gear that drives the high bow chain to the camshafts. And here it is trial fitted in the centre of the crankcases with its needle roller bearings and fossil bronze thrust washers. Before I went too much further, I wanted to ensure that the primary drive gear and the clutch mesh nicely. So I put the main gearbox main shaft in with a clutch sprocket and put the front crankshaft sprocket in, a, in the needle roller bearing and span it up and it span just nice. So I was really quite pleased. I built the crankshaft starting in the centre and working outwards. So here it is with the first flywheel we're pressed on so I can check that it rotates and clears the aluminium casings and I was so pleased that it did. And here it is out of the engine. I bought the INA needle roller bearing to the central groove and pilot hole for the oil flow. This lubricates the mains and then onwards up to the big end. And here I am pressing on the next flywheel web for the opposite side. I trial fit the crankshaft back in the crankcases every time I press on a new web just to make sure it still goes round and I was well chuffed that it spans so freely. In this shot you can see the hardened steel INA inner rings that go with the needle roller bearings complete with the oil feed hole. These are a press fit onto the crank pins. I then drilled and pinned the two central webs. And here's a trial fit of the centre comrods. I continued to assemble the crankshaft aligning the flywheel webs in my lathe. Trial fitting it back in the crankcases at every stage. Each new web that was added was drilled and pinned, drilling half into the crankshaft main journal and half into the flywheel web and then banging in a 4mm hardened dowel. And here's another flywheel web being pressed on. And at this stage it was like a new 4 cylinder crankshaft. And here's the finished six cylinder roller bearing crankshaft, all ready to fit back into the crankcases for a trial fit. I assembled all the gearbox components into the lower crankcase and dropped in the new crankshaft and it fitted perfect. I was well pleased. So I dropped on the top crankcase, did up all the bolts and fitted the starter motor, ready to put on the pistons. I fitted the pistons and then dropped on the 3.5mm thick compression plate to raise the barrels. I didn't fit the piston rings at this stage because I wanted to see if the pistons all went round nicely and hit the top dead centres together, which they did. I found it quite mesmerising watching the pistons go up and down. I could watch them all day. I hope you enjoyed this video on my RC374 crankshaft. Don't forget to like and subscribe because in future videos I'll be building the rest of the engine and making a bike.